Good afternoon to all of you here. I'm uh, here to speak under somewhat unusual circumstances. Five days ago, Hurricane Ida hit the coast of Louisiana, uh, where I live in the United States. The eye of the hurricane passed roughly 25 miles or 40 kilometers to the east of my home in Baton Rouge at about 11 p.m. on Sunday night. Um, I was not there. My family had evacuated to north northwestern Louisiana to avoid the storm. And my family was lucky. The storm had moved eastward, uh, meaning that our city did not experience a direct hit. New Orleans, the largest city in Louisiana, on the other hand, has suffered much more devastating impacts. 100% of the electricity power, the electric power grid was knocked out as transmission lines fell. Official counts that I saw last night listed the total of 43 confirmed storm, storm related deaths this week from Louisiana all the way to New York. Uh, but I'm sure that number will rise in the coming days and damage will be measured in the billions of dollars. One of the well documented trends in the past several decades is that the majority of the added solar energy on Earth has been absorbed by the oceans. Climate change negotiations and commitments often focus on surface temperatures. This is what we speak of when we discuss one degree Celsius of warming that has already occurred and goals to limit this warning to warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees. But as Hurricane Ida moved across the Gulf of Mexico, it rapidly pulled in an enormous pool of energy that had been stored in the water. Near the Louisiana coast, water temperatures were above 31 degrees Celsius or 88 degrees Fahrenheit, a remarkably high quantity of energy that fed the storm. Climate change may or may not cause the formation of one single tropical depression in the Atlantic Ocean, but the Gulf of Mexico has not always been 31 degrees in late August, and an increase of just one degree intensifies the storm with evaporation and power for the wind. One coastline station, uh, as the hurricane made landfall, measured wind gusts of over 170 miles per hour or 275 kilometers per hour. So I had intended to arrive two days ago uh, with a different set of remarks and to be here in time for all of this magnificent event. And so I want to convey my thanks and my apologies to the Normandy Chair for Peace, to ISIL and to other sponsors and partners of this event and to all the speakers whose remarks I unfortunately missed. Um, instead, I've come directly after spending two days chopping up and moving tree branches in front of my house and offering ice, water, and food to friends who are still without electricity. So I think this reality puts uh, all of our discussions today in a more urgent context. So earlier, uh, the panels addressed the question of the environmental rule of law. The rule of law in the narrowest sense is a commitment that rules apply to both strong and weak. The rules may change, but may not be altered simply upon the whim of one person or by non-legal, non-democratic means. Where law guarantees rights, the rule of law protects not only the substance and enjoyment of those rights, but also the process through which those rights are guaranteed and when necessary, circumscribed. I think it's important for us to continue to push for the progressive realization of human rights and environmental rights, which necessarily includes the principle of non-regression or no backsliding. When a legal system has guaranteed rights of nature, even when it doesn't recognize rights of nature, but recognizes an obligation to guarantee the human right to a healthy environment. And even in a legal system without formal recognition of a human right to a healthy environment, the full enjoyment of the human right to life, liberty, and even property point in the same direction, they cannot be achieved without environmental conservation conservation that considers the interests of all in society and the interests of future generations. Human rights depend on our relationship with the environment. And when we backslide, we hinder the fulfillment of those rights. So I want to introduce then at this point, um, this discussion and really memorial to recognize the defenders of nature uh, who have often sacrificed their lives uh, in the defense of environmental interests, 
human rights and the rights of nature. Over the past two months, the World Commission on Environmental Law held three regional events. The second World Environmental Law Congress leading toward and continuing through these meetings in Marseille. Um, three points raised during the World Environmental Law Congress that I want to uh, share with you as outcomes from those meetings as an agenda for this coming decade include a focus primarily on how law can protect environmental defenders in order to ensure that those <clears throat> who disproportionately bear the burdens uh, of environmental harms are not left solely with the responsibility uh, to remedy those harms or to defend uh, the environment from the continuation of those harms. Second, the urgency of dealing with climate change, as I've just addressed by discussing uh, changing weather patterns and uh, more severe weather that impacts the entire world. And third, a focus on One Health and connecting the biodiversity crisis with the appearance of new diseases, as has just been mentioned in this previous panel. So I end with where I started, um, communicating to all of you the great urgency to address climate change and also to recognize uh, the efforts and sacrifices of those uh, who advocate on behalf of the environment. So I will turn to, uh, we have several speakers and I apologize for not giving a full introduction, but I will just mention uh, them by name and their affiliation. Uh, we'll first hear from Patricia Mbote from the University of Nairobi, followed by Andy Rain from the United Nations Environment Program, uh, and then Smita Narula uh, from the Elizabeth Haub uh, School of Law at Pace University, New York. And I uh, look forward to hearing their remarks via Zoom. Uh, I will go ahead and turn the time over to, I believe, um, Dr. Mbote first. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd really like to thank the NOMA Detail of Peace and also Nick Robinson for making this possible. And I'd like to celebrate environmental heroines who are uh, known to me and uh, whose work was in Kenya. Next slide. These are Wangare Madai and Joanna Statberry. They're two women uh, with, within one ecosystem. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, the, and the next slide, these are the two women. And both of them fought for the environment. Uh, they, they were fighting against people who wanted to uh, subdue the environment and convert land into concrete. And uh, whilst one of them, Wangare Madai, was honored in her life, uh, the other one paid the ultimate uh, price. She was actually shot six bullets uh, in a forest very near the United Nations Environment Program and in Nairobi. And I'd like uh, to doubt leave this for the little video that I had put together for you to see the work they were doing. So if you can put the video on. So the video is available. So if it can't go on, then uh, you will have it because uh, it just documents the work that the two are doing. Fight one got the Nobel laureate, uh, uh, that is Wangari Madai. And uh, Joanna was fighting for a forest. Actually, she was shot just a month ago as she got into her house, six bullets. And I think what that reminds us is that the success that we thought that Wangari had had in protecting the environment, that is forests and uh, other ecosystems, it is uh, not uh, time to celebrate yet because uh, barely 10 years after her death, we now have somebody being shot because of her fight for nature, fighting developers who wanted to take land in a forest to develop it into concrete. So maybe uh, my last minute, uh, since we can't watch the video, we can, uh, observe a minute of silence in honor of Joanna, who left us just barely a month ago.
Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share these stories. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Mbote. I'm sorry that I think there's a change in the schedule that we've had due to moving some things around. Um, but I wanna thank you very much for, for those remarks. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if we can show the video now, but if not, then we'll um, have that link available for people to be able to watch. Um, so moving uh, next, we'll, have, we'll hear from a presentation from uh, Tony Oposa. Um, and following that, then we'll hear from uh, Smita Narula from the Elizabeth Hope School. Eli, Eli. Tulog anay, wala diri ang imong nanay. Kadto tienda, makal tinapay, saging gatas, hakalamay. Ini eli, tulog anay, wala diri ang imong nanay. Kadto tienda. We'll now hear from Professor Narula. 
Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. As many of you know, each year the Elizabeth Howe School of Law at Pace University confers the Howe Award on individuals and groups who have made remarkable contributions to the field of environmental law and diplomacy. There are indeed several Howe Award laureates among us today. This year, um, coming up on October 12, 2021, the award will be conferred on two individuals, Ugandan climate justice activist Vanessa Nakate and Dr. Wang Shi, environmental law scholar and advocate from China. Please save the date. The event will be held virtually and more information will be shared. But I'm here to talk to you and to present a video clip from our ceremony last year when on October 12th, which was also commemorated by many as Indigenous Peoples Day in the United States, the Haub Award was conferred in memoriam on environmental defenders who had lost their lives defending their land and the environment from mining, logging, and agribusiness industries, among other destructive industries. According to the 2020 Global Witness Report, Defending Tomorrow, 2019 was the highest year on record until that date for killings of environmental defenders, with 212 killings documented primarily in the Global South, including in the Philippines, a clip of those issues which was just shown by Tony Oposa, and a majority or a predominant number of those killed um, were Indigenous peoples. Much of these killings, of course, is driven by industries, but the industries themselves are responding to rabid consumption across the globe, and especially in the global north. Countless more environmental and land rights defenders have been silenced through violent attacks, arrests, death threats, or retaliatory lawsuits against public participation. Women are also being targeted with gender-based violence and threats. Increasingly, laws and policies are being adopted that are likely to make it harder, not easier, for citizens to take a stand against destructive projects by increasing the associated risks. In response to this rising tide of attacks, the Elizabeth Haub School of Law sought to raise awareness of this issue and called for the protection of environmental defenders, as well as the accountability of parties for the violence and environmental destruction they cause. We also saw through the conferring of this award to call for the strengthening of environmental rule of law around the globe. And underneath that, we must also break the unsustainable consumption patterns that fuel the violations of human rights. We are indebted to environmental defenders and they deserve our recognition and support. Um, as the video is queued up that we're about to play, I'll explain what will soon be shown. We would love for you to hear directly from those whose lives are at risk right now as a result of consumption patterns um, being fueling uh, the rise of destructive industries all over the globe. The first half is a video prepared by the NGO Global Witness, which shows very movingly how environmental and land rights defenders around the world are increasingly under attack. And the second half of the video asks viewers to join in a few minutes of silence as the names of defenders who were killed in 2019, 219 documented in all is scrolled on the screen. I'll conclude before the video is shown by remarking that I, um, there are many words that we could give to what is happening. The term sacrifice implies a voluntary action on the part of those whose lives are being lost. I, I would instead use the word murder or killings of individuals um, who are in the crossfires with the ways in which we are continuing to um, in, just inhale and destroy the planet that is our home. We stand in solidarity with those who have been killed, who have lost their lives. Um, and I hope you will join us in hearing from them and in a moment of silence and taking all action that we can to stand in support and solidarity with these environmental and land rights defenders. Thank you. Es Ramón Bedoya Peñata. Mi nombre es María de Socorro Costa da Silva. La patanga ya nga gin paduguan, padayon gid na nga dapat mabawi.
la amenaza fueron casi constantes, porque siempre decían que lo iban a matar, que lo iban a desplazar. Yo me siento presa, ¿no? Pero yo no puedo calar, porque yo también digo que soy dona de ese chão. Yo tomo banho con agua poluida, nos cocinamos con agua poluida, nos lavamos a nuestra ropa con agua poluida. A comida es para Dayun. Siempre, ang ginhimon ni tatay nga po na pagigwan sa area. Tapos, dapat maagi sa maayo nga pamaagi. Los lo grupos paramilitares con, la, con las guerrillas, el ejército. Y ahora en la reclamación de la tierra ha matado muchos líderes también. Ahí como mataron a mi padre, también han matado a muchos más por estar reclamando la tierra. No le vayan a hacer algo como lo hicieron con su papá. No quisiera que me sacara ninguno de mis hijos. Yo no quiero morirme yo aquí. Kung mahambal kayo sa tagiya sang plantation, maluoy man sa samon kay wala kami sang kaya amon siya, manggaranon na siya. Quando é que eu vou ter a minha carta de euforia? Eu não tenho endereço próprio. Cadê o meu título? Ya entonces ahí me tocó seguir los mismos pasos que él llevaba ya a seguir para que nos regrese a nuestro territorio otra vez. Antes de las grandes empresas llegar aquí, nos vivía de nuestra cultura.
My thanks very much to um, the Normandy Chair of Peace, Isom Mothers, for giving space for, for this memoriam. Thank you very much, Professor Narula, um, for that touching tribute and um, very moving to you. To see and to pause and reflect as all of those names pass across the screen of, uh, you know, individuals who uh, have suffered um, the worst of the of the worst environmental impacts and then um, have also lost their lives as a result of it. Um, so, uh, thank you again to all of those who have spoken on this panel. Um, I think it's a really uh, important topic to end on near the conclusion of this meeting uh, to reflect on how law may be reformed uh, as you know part of our agenda over this next decade to uh, improve the ways in which law can protect the human rights of environmental defenders and all those who uh, suffer the impacts of uh, environmental damage throughout the world. Um, so uh, I want to encourage you to thank you know thanks all to all of those who have spoken uh on this panel and again thank you for your patience in uh, figuring out the change of of order of events so at this time um i would like to turn uh the floor over to professor emily gaillard who will provide the closing for uh this colloquium over the past two days that we have had thank you all very much <laughs>